I'm not kidding, I honestly can. You need our help. <laughs> you need our help. You need all help. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, will, will you sing the mail song? <laughs> So right around that time, right when I was a freshman, I incidentally won a little acting award in my little region in Pennsylvania, and then like Cobra Kai, I got to go to the I got to go to the state level, and I won that, and I, then I won a national acting award, and because of that, I had some interest in New York City from agents and managers and stuff, and my friends were like, "Do not be an idiot, go try this." You know, you have this opportunity. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to succeed in life, the thing that I should do, if following your dream is, if that's what success is, then I have to go to New York, right? I have to quit college and move to New York City to, to be an actor, and that's what I did. I moved to New York City to be Al Pacino, right? Yeah. I wanted, like I had long hair, I was like young and dangerous. You know, I was like an intense actor, that's what I did, I was like, really dark and moody, and that was my thing. That's what I was good at, right? That's what I won the award for. Like, dangerous, intense man. So I moved to New York to be dangerous, intense actor man, and I, I crashed with friends. I lived in Times Square, right across from the bus station, which back then was legit frightening. It was like a neighborhood full of prostitution and crack, and it was scary, and I lived in a shelf in a hallway, I built the shelf in a hallway, and it was like this far from the ceiling, and I had to crawl in on a yoga mat at night with like my duffel bag full of books and dirty clothes and lay there, and there was a light right here, and if they turned it on, if the, my roommates turned it on, it would burn me, and then I had to like crawl out at night, and it was like terrifying and awesome because I was living my dream <laughs> to be gritty Al Pacino man. And then immediately, I had this audition for what I assumed was the voice of an animated kid show. I didn't even know it was a live audition. I thought I was just auditioning to be the voice of this character on this show called Blue's Clues. And I went into the audition and there was a camera in the room. And I was like, oh no, I guess I better do stuff. And um, I just kind of, did my thing. I was like, I'm gonna Al Pacino the hell out of this. <laughs> and that's what I did. Like it was supposed to be, basically it was supposed to be like a game show. It was supposed to be like, which one is the triangle? You guessed it, you sure are smart. Which one is the circle? Good job. But I was like, no way, man, I'm here to be Gritty Actor Man. So I was like, which one is the thing? <laughs> but I got so, I was like walking up to the camera, I was like, do you know? <laughs> You're so smart. And the people in the room are like, this is weird. <laughs> but but they showed it to kids and kids they they froke out. Kids were like, this is the man who will be on the show. Kids were like touching the screen and freaking out. And so accidentally that worked. And then instead of being Al Pacino, I was this guy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, like wearing all of these pants and these stripes, and I'm talking to bars of soap and salt shakers, and I'm like skidooing into things, and I'm singing crazy songs. And, and then it was like stepping onto this green striped train, and it just went poof, and it just took off. And it was immediately like the highest rated kid show that year. It was beating Sesame Street in the ratings. We were in Australia, we were in Canada, we were in South America. All this stuff was happening. And then years later, I was like, okay, that happened. That was insane. That was awesome. That was the most amazing thing. But I worried that I wasn't successful because that wasn't my dream. Because that was an accident, right? I never for one second in my life until that moment considered being on children's television. Not for a second. It never crossed my mind. If I had known 
that that audition was not a voiceover audition, I don't know if I'd have gone. Right? So I was worried that because I had given myself a prescription for what happiness, what success, what it will, what my dream is, I had defined a dream. And because I was not living that dream, I was worried that I was not succeeding in life. That's real. That's crazy, but that's real. So when that was over, when Blue's Clues was over, uh, when my contract was up, I had coincidentally developed a relationship with my favorite band, right? I literally just knew some people that knew them. They were a band called The Flaming Lips, and they were really cool, and I loved them. And, uh, and I happened to get my, I was also still a musician. It was always another one of my dreams. And so I managed to get their producer, my demo, and he called me. And he was like, are you in the Blues Clues, Dan? Yeah. I was like, yeah. He was like, yeah, man, I, I heard your demo, and I, I only listened to it to make fun of it. But it's kind of good. <laughs> like, what are you, what, are you like, did you write this? I'm like, yeah. He said, well, do you want to come work on it? I was like, yeah, of course I do. I was like, aha, I must be doing something right, you know? And I was like, ah, I'll just do this dream now. I'll simply live a different dream. The other dream must have been wrong. So now I'll live this dream. So I went and I worked with this guy and I met the band and we became like really good friends. And then they played on my record and made my songs not suck. And then they were like, this is awesome. Do you want to come on tour with us? And I was like, yes, I do. That's the thing I want the most in the world. I'm going to live my new dream. So they took me on a tour in the United Kingdom with them. And I opened for them for like 5,000 people, um, which, was, which was crazy. Right, and I'm up there on, on stage at the Hammersmith Apollo in London where David Bowie debuted uh, Ziggy Stardust. And I'm like, oh my God, this is happening. This is amazing. So I'm sitting there, I'm playing. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Steve Bird, let's go, yeah. And I start playing my first song and 5,000 people come up to the stage. And by the end of that song, they all went back to the bar. And they never came back for the whole tour. Like, it was legit bad. I was bad. And it was hard. And it hurt. And it was, I, it was not good. And at the end of that tour, uh, my musical hero, the lead singer of that band, a man named Wayne, really honest man and a very good friend, sat me down. He was like, he's from Oklahoma. Sorry. <laughs> but he was like, Steve Burns, goddamn. That was, that was not good. <laughs> he's like, but I'll tell you why. He's like, people come to rock and roll shows for three reasons, right? They come to get drunk. They come to maybe hook up. And they come to watch people believe in themselves in ways that they cannot. And he's like, you don't buy this, so this doesn't work. Right? And I was like, well, that's, uh, that's definitely true. <laughs> so then I was like, okay. So I must have failed there because that dream, I didn't live that dream. So there I was really confused and I'm running out of time here, but so I'll skip the next 15 years. But after that, I became, I had this career in voiceover. I became like a voiceover guy. Like, I'm, I'm the guy who says Snickers satisfies. Like, I do all these voiceover things. And that's a great job. Like, that's an awesome job. But it didn't align with any dream that I thought that I had. And what I've, like, I don't have any advice and I don't have like a huge lesson for you guys on these things. But what I can say is that I no longer look at my dreams in the same way. I still want them. I still have them. I still value my dreams. I still look to be inspired in life. And I still hope to have a concept of what moves me, right? But I no longer look at life like, how do I say it? I, I no longer look at life like, 
what I want to be in the world. I now look at it like how I want to be in the world, right? And when I look at it that way, there's nothing in the last 20 years that I can point to that is just incredibly exciting and lucky and fortunate and amazing. And if, if you can see the dreams as really just providing clues for the journey, right? Then you can really sort of take one step at a time, right? And it'll be an entirely different trip. That's at least what I've noticed. So I'll leave it there and then we can get to the Q&A where I can talk to you guys more. Uh, in acting, there is, uh, there's kind of a technique called clown. And I don't mean like Hong Kong, I'm in a car with a crazy wig, scary clown. There's a kind of a higher form of clown, right? And that's what I was doing with Steve. I looked at him like almost like an old Italian Del Arte, sort of old school clown, right? And the way I was doing it is you play two, there's two qualities at once. And Steve's two qualities were wonder. He was like, oh, about everything. And then vulnerability, right? So there was always that undercut there. Like, oh my God, what if they say no? And then when you would say yes, I'd be like, cool, great, let's go get the mail. You know, <laughs> that's the, those, are, those are the two pedals for that. I love that. That's, speaking of how Steve, his personified character was, um, how can we be that influence as like to younger kids, to younger generations um, for us? So you can have positive like influence. Well, I guess what I would say that if you're gonna emulate Steve, <laughs> don't jump into pictures. <laughs> don't do that. That was bad modeling. Um, Steve's not afraid to ask for help. That's big and that's hard, by the way. That's been hard for me. I've needed help. Even recently, I've needed help. It's hard to admit that. Are you okay? Um, it takes a, it's a courage thing, you know? I guess it is for me. I don't want to admit that I need help, but sometimes I totally do. And uh, if that's actually a great way to look at that, Jayla. So like, if, if Steve could be a role model in any way, I think it would be that he was not afraid to ask when he needed it. That's right. Oh. <laughs> That's really good. I love that. Um, kind of, kind of talking about as well with uh, Blue's Clues um, as a focus. Technology's gone a long way as far as green screen, digital, everything. Um, what was it like in the two thousands to be working off of a green screen uh, with a digital character as your partner? <laughs> First of all, it was a blue screen. Because, no, it was because my shirt was green. Uh, uh, um, oh my God, and I sometimes I do um, appearances on the new reboot of Blue's Clues, and he's on a green screen. And uh, I also write and direct for the new thing. And uh, I wrote an episode where Steve just kind of shows up and eats cookies. And, uh, <laughs> and I was directing that episode. And it was so hard. Because he's on, a blue, he's on a green screen. And basically there had to be a dude following me around with a blue screen behind me. <laughs> it was so hard, so challenging. So anyway, in, in 1995, by the way, which is when we started doing Blue's Clues, um, we were doing it on desktop Macintosh computers, which looked like bubbles back then. It was so cheap. What we were doing was crazy. We were doing it in After Effects, and we didn't even have a real soundstage. And uh, I didn't, I mean, I would, if you can imagine being at the bottom of a, an empty swimming pool, that's what it was like. You know, and that's one of the reasons why I want to turn lights on and everything, because Blue's Clues to me, even still, feels like this really tiny show, right? Because it was just me and a camera and a whole bunch of lights 
And so it always felt like a tiny little thing that I was doing with this one camera. You know, and they would tell me, like, oh, you know, it's, it's in all these countries now, and 259 kids watch it, and I'd be like, okay. <laughs> cool. So uh, nowadays, the new guy has it much easier. Um, he, he understands that. Like, uh, he can just, like, he can just be, like, um, for, for example, this is a real thing. Back in the day, they would try to fit me into the animation as opposed to fit the animation around me. So I would be on the bottom of the swimming pool and I'd be like, okay, this is right, this is wrong. And we'd have to do it again for that amount of right or wrong. So it was really super tedious and super hard, not just for me, for the directors, for, for everyone. And now, just just because of the nature of the way that animation can work, um, you know, the new guy Josh can be like, "Oh, can I pick up the salt shaker and throw it across the room? That's cool." What if I like do like a dance with the dog and like spin it around? They're like, "Yeah, fine, do whatever you want." So <laughs> it's a much more creative process now than it was then. It was, I would say, back then it was more defined by our limits, um, and now it's kind of sky's the limit. I hope that I hope the the story that I was delivering made a form of sense, you know, like, my dreams have changed a lot, like, all the time. And this concept that you have to define that when you're, what, 16? And live your life according to that? Is a little bonkers, you know? That doesn't mean you shouldn't have dreams, that you shouldn't value your dreams. But like I said before, the dreams are really just there to inform the journey. Yeah. What's your name? Sorry, I forget everybody's names. I'm so rude. I know that's, is that Alyssa? Yeah. Okay. Who was the other in question? I'm Kate. Hi, Kate. I'm Steve. <laughs> what's your name? Uh, my name, my story is a surprise because my name is Baylor. Okay. Left the university. <laughs> right on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, after seeing you on YouTube recently and do this, I understand now that you're a music person, but what affected me from the show is all the little tunes. So, we just got the letters and all those things. <laughs> they run through my head yeah. constantly. And I was curious, like, did you come up with those? Does someone else have a creative license if you come with that? Because, like, you know, singing, but um, they just are constantly playing through my head because I just watch it as a kid so much. I'll give you an example. Um, in the script, right? I think there's a video taken of this somewhere. I gotta dig it up. But in the script of the audition, it just says, we are looking for Blue's Clues. We are looking for Blue's Clues. We are looking for Blue's Clues. Wonder where they are. And it says, singing. <laughs> right? And I was like, I... <laughs> All right. So I did, you ever hear the song, Let's All Go to the Lobby? Let's all go to the lobby, let's all go to the lobby. We are looking for Blue's Clues, I wonder where they are. Awesome. Right? So that's what I did in the audition, which is like two notes different. And uh, and they tried to use Let's All Go to the Lobby for the show, and they were like, oh, we can't get the rights to that. So our musician, who also is Melox, uh, changed two notes and made all of the money. <laughs> <laughs> he totally did. <laughs> but so yeah, so um, I was responsible for a couple of places in the song, in the, in the show, where I'd be like, you know, I think this guy would sing when he gets the mail. <laughs> we really do. But I didn't write that song. The mail ox wrote that song. And the funny thing about the end of that song is I couldn't hit the note, right? It was too high for me. I mean, you hear my voice is like naturally deep. I used to lose my voice constantly on Blue's Clues because I was like, hi, it's me. I, I, I literally can't talk like that. <laughs> you know, and that song was way too high. It's like, here's, that's, it's, I think that was the first note. Like, I couldn't do it. And I couldn't hit the, the, the end note, so I just Pee Wee Herman it. <laughs> He's like, great, we're using that. <laughs> oh my gosh. We have one more up here. 
for a second, I won't know. You guys probably won't know these films, but I'm kind of a disciple of uh, a certain era of filmmaking in the 70s, right? So there's the, there's the Godfather, and then there's, um, there's a film, if you haven't seen it, it's called Dog Day Afternoon. That was one of the movies that blew my mind. Um, those two movies made me go, oh, I feel like I could do that, you know? Also, Dustin Hoffman was another one. He has a film called Midnight Cowboy, yeah. which was, uh, I still think it's one of the most, his, his performance in Midnight Cowboy is one of the best things I've ever seen. Also, The Graduate was another film. That era of filmmaking, I say Al Pacino just because I don't, um, just because I'm doing a story up here and it's easier just to pick one, and he probably was my favorite. But uh, it's that whole era of the kind of short, Italian-looking, dangerous actor guy. <laughs> you know, that I obviously identify with, you know. But the two biggies for me for Pacino were Godfather and uh, Dog Day After. Awesome question. All right, we have one up here. She's been, she's been dying to ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> we're so close. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am, what was your name? I'm sorry, I didn't ask. Okay. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> John? John Carlo Mazzacco? Yeah, he, he killed my father's paternity. Oh! Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, and what's your name? Victoria. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, the main question I wanted to ask, how did it feel when you, Joe, and Josh were all up together, three different generations of groups, groups up on the Thanksgiving Day Parade? I mean, for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. You're not gonna believe this, but we are all great friends. Um, Donovan, who plays Joe, and I, in particular, are trouble. <laughs> like, I adore him. I adore his family. Like, we are super tight. And uh, when I write episodes of Blue's Clues, I write him into the last scene every time just so they have to fly him in from LA. So that I can go <laughs> And uh, Josh is wonderful. We, we, we are really good friends. Josh and I have almost all the same interests. Um, we get along great. It's almost too good because we, we're very unfocused on stuff, <laughs> especially Donovan and I. But um, that was wonderful. The Macy's Day Parade was wonderful. Core memory, happy, just, oh. It's just a joy. It was just such a joy. And I thank all of you for that. Yeah. It was just really, really great to be there with my boys. <laughs> because I feel like, you know, I'm the OG. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're my boys. They're learning. But great question. And now, um, you had a question. Um, what's your name? Shannon. Shannon, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, my question is, uh, do you have any advice for people who are want to go into the artistic profession and kind of how to navigate the auditions and, um, I guess, connections with the yeah, artists? I mean, I mean, that's kind of what I was trying to touch on in the thing. Like, <laughs> no, but I mean, it's such a... Mm. I, you know what I would say, and I know I'm a weird guy to, um, just generally, but also a weird person to, to maybe give this advice, is if you can figure out a way to look at it as something you support, as opposed to something that supports you, I think that's a good shift. 
Um, and I would take my friend Wayne's advice, the guy who told me that I was bad at it. I would pay, I would get real. I would get real and I would take bold steps and see what the universe is telling me. That's, honestly, that's kind of brutal advice, but I, that is the real advice that I feel, the real real is. I would be brave and I would take big shots and I would listen, see if you're led. Take big shots that are honest, do your best. If you're not doing your best, you didn't take a big shot, right? So don't, don't go out there and screw up and be like, oh, didn't happen. You know, like do your best work. And if the world is responding to that, that's a clue. <laughs> you know, but you gotta be, I think, I don't consider myself to be a great actor, great musician, great director, or anything like that, but I know some guys that I would consider to be that. And they are brutally honest with themselves. They don't fool themselves. And they work so hard. So those who think about terms of connections and all like that, I don't really know um, how it works anymore. It's different now. You know, uh, auditions now happen remotely. Everything happens. In, the, the way that people see each other's work is very different now, so I wouldn't particularly know that. We have some, yeah, some of the over there. Very passionate, hand in the back. <laughs> Hi, Steve, how are you? What's your name? Kelly. Oh, same. Oh, oh hi, Kelly. Well, hi. Um, you touched on the importance of taking care of ourselves, and I just wanted to know. Um, there you go. <laughs> I just wanted to know what are your forms of self care? How do you take care of yourself? What does Steve like to do to? make sure that he is okay, you know, in his heart, gut, in his mind, his soul. Oh. Um, you know, the real answer is, uh, I found, years ago, I found Soto Zen Buddhism, uh, which sounds like, it's not. <laughs> it's very secular Buddhism. It's just a meditation practice, but it's very hardcore. It's not, I mean, when you think of like Buddhism and meditation, you might think of like happy monks in orange robes who are like, ah, oh. <laughs> Soto Zen is, very, is a Japanese form of Buddhism. It's very austere. And uh, I meditate uh, about two feet in front of a wall with my eyes open. You know, uh, change my life in a lot of ways because it's much more about, it's not about being happy, and it's not about being sad, it's about not attaching to either of those, happy or sad. You know, I live in, um, I don't want to get too into this philosophy stuff, but I live in, um, I live in the mountains in upstate New York, right? I live in a little off-grid house uh, in upstate New York, and I'm right at the base of this mountain, and I look outside and I just see this mountain, and there's an old saying, you know, be the mountain, not the storm. And I watch weather blow over this mountain every day. And sometimes it's sunny weather, and that's awesome. Sometimes it's a crappy rainstorm, and that's crappy. But the mountain is always there, right? So I, that is self-care. Uh, take a lot of baths, because <laughs> they're great. Um, yeah, I'm pretty active, and uh, I don't indulge in, uh, you know, the negative feelings. It's very easy to do that, depending on your brain chemistry, which is a uh, whole other conversation that I'd love to have at some point. But for some people, it's not easy to not be negative, and uh, I think self-care can be about knowing how to navigate that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we can take two more questions. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, the one who's confidently staff standing, she's there. <laughs> Steve, we're the 90s babies. Hey, Me, well. 
What's your name? Candace and Matt. Oh, um, I'm Sierra. Hi. We're the 90 babies, okay? <laughs> so my question is, I knew that it was a motion for us when you left, but how did it impact you mentally and emotionally for you? Because I know that y'all tried to prepare to leave, you know, to have your depart, but how did it feel at that moment for you? Oh, when I left the show? Yes. I mean, I was sad, you know, um, it was hard for me because I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I was leaving something very successful. So I was taking a risk. I was a little scared. I was a little sad. And I'll tell you, there was a, the thing where, the, the, the last thing I said on Blue's Clues is I came up to the camera and I was like, thank you so much for all your help. Like it was like a sad moment. But boo, they, they aired the easy one. We made, they were the really sad one. It was like, whoa. It was, it was such a heart. Oh my god, they were like, we cannot put that on TV. Because it was such a tearjerker. But so I was sad, you know, and nervous, I guess is the real response. But also excited. You know, the, the first thing I did when I, I st after that last day, I sat with one of the producers and I made sure all the takes were good and they had everything they needed and I shaved my head. I was like, we don't need to reshoot anything. I'm shaving my head. Because I was going bald so fast. Oh my God. And I was just, and they were like, every, every morning I would go into the makeup thing, like, <clears throat> I'm ready for my makeup now. And they would just get a can of fake hair just <laughs> on the back of my head. And I'd be looking in the mirror, like, yeah, this is probably the last season. <laughs> this is probably <laughs> Question. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. <laughs> um, young man, right there. Yes. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I just wanted to end this um, on like a really light note. Well, maybe not. But I also, I also feel bad for asking this because you said you can't sing the last note. Uh, I'm not singing. I can. <laughs> uh, you guys can. Yes. Yeah, I'm not kidding, I honestly can't. You need our help. I understand. <laughs> you need our help. You need all help. Yeah. 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 I mean, will, will you sing the mail song? <laughs> yeah. Is that what you meant? Yes. Uh, I would love to. You will? Yeah. Yes. Great. And by with me, I mean for me. <laughs> all right, I'll start it. You ready? Here's the mail in every building. Take me on the way When it comes, I want to help. That was pretty good. Yeah. Actually, we can take one more question. We have one more time, one more question. Um, one in the middle. Middle. Uh, hi, my name is Madison. I'm Madison. Oh, the book recommendation is going to be hard because I mean that's such a personal thing. Uh, but I'll think of something for you. My favorite albums of all time: uh, "Soft Bulletin" by The Flaming Lips, uh, "Hunky Dory" by David Bowie. Uh, that's a very, very good album. Um, there's a couple of Leonard Cohen albums that I love. I'm listening right now to a lot of Cigaros from those guys. Um, it's too hard. It's too hard. Too many albums. It's like saying, it's like my brain just goes. Like, um, my favorite book of all time. I don't know if you've ever read Frankenstein. It's worth reading. That is, ex it's, I, I read that like once a year, I think. Um, I'm trying to think of other classics that I've really enjoyed. I read Moby Dick finally. Maybe don't. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that is time. Thank you all so much. Give a huge round of applause. Thank you so much for coming out on the Friday night. Thank you. Yes, Steve! I love you, Steve!